दामोदर कृष्णा वेर्लेकर मेमोरियल लेक्चर स्पीकर डॉक्टर ऑस्कर रिबेलो सब्जेक्ट गोवा अ पोल्यूटेड स्टेट ऑफ माइंड डॉक्टर ऑस्कर रिबेलो अ फिजिशियन बाय वोकेशन इज अ ट्रूली फेंटेस्टिक ओरेटर वी हैव एंजॉयड लिसनिंग टू हिम एट पब्लिक मीटिंग्स ऑन टेलीविजन डिबेट्स एट प्रेस कॉन्फ्रेंसेस एट ऑल ही हैज ऑलवेज टॉक्ड अ लॉट ओवर द लास्ट फ्यू इयर्स बट ही हैज ऑलवेज टॉक्ड सेंस His oratory is second only to the content that he delivers. His desire for a diverse and inclusive Goa showcases his passion for societal harmony and unity while celebrating diversity within the nation. His outspoken commitment to upholding democratic values along with his exemplary oratory skills position him as one of Goa's influential personalities. His involvement in complex issues like the Regional Plan 2001 illegal mining and madhi river demonstrate this dr oscar possesses a strong academic background having earned a gold medal during his md medicine in 1994-95 he has been associated with goa medical college as an associate professor at the medicine department after which he has made impactful contributions to the healthcare sector as a consulting physician by the way this is just for the record as mentioned earlier Dr Oscar has always talked a lot but always talked sense and today we have the pleasure to listen to him educate us on Goa a polluted state of mind giving me this opportunity and this great privilege to speak to you i'm speaking actually on a public platform in a very very long time so i don't know i just hope i haven't lost my touch <coughs> So when Sarila asked me what I would like to speak on I told him I'd like to speak on something about Goa obviously <coughs> but uh, you know we've seen Goa rapidly evolve and more correctly rapidly degenerate over the last 15 years or so my involvement with activism albeit very small has been over the last around two decades or so and the galloping pace at which the degeneration of goa and the goan way of life has been happening is not just alarming it's not just disheartening but it almost feels like as if you are in gaza almost feels like the end of time But is that really true, or are we overreacting? But to an extent, this is true: <clears throat> that the Goa that once was, that the Goa most of us identify with, today it definitely, for each and every one of us, is a polluted state of mind. So I essentially want to look at this pollution, or look at this evolution of ours. through a different lens through a different kind of prism and i would structure it on in three ways one is the genesis how did we get here at all how did we get to this present position which would take me about maybe i've promised to speak for about half an hour and then i just answer questions because you know i can't just go on speaking because that gets too much So about 15 minutes is what I will speak on how we have come to this pass the genesis of our problem the third part of my talk will be on solutions to whether we can really do something about what goa is the state that goa is in or we just throw up our hands and say that's the end of it we just lie back and look at the degeneration and well weep you know crying by the rivers of babylon as it were and the middle part is the problems that goa faces so 15 minutes will be on the genesis of the problem 15 minutes on the solution and maybe about 20 seconds on the problems that goa faces because i think all of us know what the problems of goa face not only do we know we experience we feel it's a part of us it's a part of our daily living so if we want to address this problem or get to this problem of where we are now 
the first thing that we need to change, or the first thing we need to do, is we need to identify who is responsible for the mess that we are in. It's very easy to blame the politician. The easiest way is to blame the politician. It's easiest to blame captains of industry. It's easiest to blame the bureaucrats. It's easiest to blame even the judiciary, the cops and the judiciary, or the entire system. But unless each and every one of us actually believes, actually internalizes this particular philosophy, that each and every one of us, you and I, are responsible for the mess that we are in. Unless we do this, we cannot take the next step forward. Because what has happened in Goa over the, especially over the last two decades or so, is a complete breakdown of trust. A breakdown of trust in the political establishment, which happens in every society. Everybody gets angry with the political class. A breakdown of trust in the entire system, bureaucratic, judicial, cops, just about everything. But the worst bit has been the breakdown of trust between ourselves. We are not capable of trusting one another. A Goan does not trust another Goan today. And that is the, not just the dangerous bit, but if that happens and that continues, that's irreconcilable. You cannot come back to a new normal if that continues to that level. As a matter of fact, have we ever thought to ourselves, have we ever asked ourselves, you know, post-1961, we always love to consider our history, you know, the epochs of Goa. No? Opinion poll, does everyone agree that opinion poll is one of the big epoch-making events of our history, you agree? The language agitation, you agree? Konkani, you agree that that's another epoch-making event about Goa? Yes? Apparently these two. Then, of course, we've had the environmental issues. I'll come about that later on. But these are two essential issues which we talk about defining the characteristic of Goa. Opinion poll and the language agitation. Everyone in agreement there? So the question I want to pose to you is in the opinion poll and in the language agitation, who won and who lost? And the answer is very simple. A Goan won and a Goan lost. Whether it's the opinion poll, whether it's the language agitation, a Goan won and a Goan lost. And we have never, ever tried to reconcile this fact in our history. And that is essentially what is our problem. We are a completely divided society. 1.5 million people, if you include all the noisemakers from the diaspora, but 1.5 million people, and we are split down the middle, not knowing what our essential identity is, and not knowing, therefore, how to move together as a group. So we are constantly fighting amongst ourselves. Is it this Konkani, that Konkani? Is it Konkani? Is it Marathi? Is it Goa, Maharashtra, this culture, that culture? So unless we realize that it has to be an inclusive kind of society where we take everyone's viewpoints along. And everyone's viewpoints, even if they don't match ours, still constitutes Goa, still constitutes that which is Goan. Unless we reconcile ourselves to this fact, we cannot form one amalgamated force that can take on these enemies of Goa that are out to destroy all that is there about Goa. So we need to understand that we are responsible, each and every one of us are responsible in some way, small or big, for the mess that we are in and that we still cannot come together as one force 
because we are still fighting culture wars at a time when we are almost facing annihilation as a species in this particular country. If we don't get this, we do not move one step forward. So where are we at the present moment? As a doctor, you know, I'd like to understand where is Goa presently? I think that is the, <laughs> the drum beat. It's trying to tell us that this is the end of Goa and the moment it stops, that'll be the end. So where are we in Goa? Are we like terminally ill? Do we say that we are terminally ill? Nothing can be done. Throw your hands up in the air. Get your Portuguese passport, pack your bags and get out of this place. Is that where we are? I'd like to think that we are in the intensive care unit. We are hooked up onto machines, we are on the ventilator, we are on expensive antibiotics. But as I've seen in the intensive care unit, even a very, very sick patient can sometimes make a recovery and can come out of the sickness and can walk out of the hospital a perfectly healthy human being. So we are there. So there is still hope. However dim that light may be, there is still hope. We are not in a stage of complete terminal decline. So we need to cling on to that hope and we need to know how to harness that hope forward. So to come to the present day, let's contextualize our history. In my opinion, there have just been two political parties, two significantly in power. I'm not talking about multiple political parties that came and went like little straws in the wind. I'm talking about two significant political parties that created an impact on Goan society, which were purely Goan in origin, a kind of by the Goan, for the Goan, and off the Goan parties. One was Bau's, Bau's Maharashtra Vadi Gomantak party, not today's Maharashtra Vadi Gomantak party. The second was Jack Sequeira's United Goans Democratic Party, not Radha Rao's United Goans Democratic Party. These two. These are the only two political parties that were perfectly Goan in culture. They had the Goan interest in heart. And here, even if your politics differ, we must understand that the architect of modern Goa is Bausai Bandodkar. This was the man in 1961, I'd like to call him the Nelson Mandela of Goan politics. The Nelson Mandela of Goan politics. Look at a simple dichotomy in Africa today. South Africa had Nelson Mandela and it's a robust economic powerhouse there in Africa because Nelson Mandela came up from within the indigenous community, he went through, of course, all his trials and tribulations in Robben Island and all the rest of it. But he did not take capital away completely from the white class, but he redistributed the land and redistributed the benefits to a large section of the black population, which was suffering because of apartheid. That's Nelson Mandela's politics in South Africa. And next door, you have Zimbabwe, where you have that despot Rob Robert Mugabe, who came in with his bandits, he threw out every capital, every piece of little, little bit of capital that was there in, in then Rhodesia, present day Zimbabwe, threw out the capital, threw out the white landowners, threw out everybody with intelligence and with the brains to conduct industry and economics and finance and all the rest of it, and just redistributed the land to all his lackeys who were, you, you know, his party members, and look at the economic mess that Zimbabwe in is in today. So Bau Saheb Bandodkar at that point of time, once the Portuguese left, please remember that the Portuguese left, but the reins of economic power in Goa remained in the hands of the elites, both Hindu and Catholic. This is very, very important for us to remember and acknowledge. Land economy remain in the hands of the elites of both the Hindu and the Catholic community in Goa. 
and Bau Sahib Bandodkar redistributed that wealth, whether it was the Land to the Tiller Act, whether it was education to all the marginalized classes in Goa, which the Portuguese didn't even look at, forget about, you know, didn't even acknowledge that they existed. He educated these children in Marathi. Marathi was the medium. That is the reason why they are so close to Marathi. Not that they hate Konkani. They love Marathi because that was the language in which they were educated. That is the language that gave them a sense of pride. That is the language that gave them knowledge. That is the language that lifted them up. And it got lifted by the policies and politics of Bau Sahib Bandotkar. So he redistributed that wealth in, from 1961 onwards, took away a little bit of all the ancestral property you and I inherited, which, I mean, what is inheritance? You should be earning your own property. But you inherited property, so he took a little bit, 10% of that, gave it to somebody else. You know, we the fatted calves started crying about it. But those marginalized classes lifted themselves out slowly out of poverty to the standard of living that they are in today. So without firing a single bullet, this man actually brought about an egalitarian, more or less egalitarian society in Goa. So this is a debt of gratitude we owe to that man. After that, from 1980 onwards, whatever the intentions of a Pratap Singh Rani who was a long-standing, Pratap Singh Rani was the original Rani, not the present Rani. I've got nothing to do with him. <laughs> so whatever the good intentions of Pratap Singh Rani might have been, he set up the university, he set up Kadamba, he set up a large number of good projects for Goa. And he might have wanted to do more, but he was essentially subservient to Delhi. Whatever Manohar Parikar and Matani Sultana may have wanted to do for Goa in the, 2000, in the 2000s when they were in power, they may have had the best of intentions, but they certainly couldn't move forward because, again, they were subservient to Delhi. So in the 60s, in the 70s, we remain quintessentially Goan. From the 80s onward, from being a colony of the Portuguese, we ended up being a colony of Delhi. And then sometimes you wonder, you know, what is it about Goa, especially our generation, I'm a generation in the 70s, in the sense, grew up in the 70s. Dilip is 1930, but whatever. But there are a lot of you from the 1950s, probably, you know, kids at 1950s who were, who grew up in the Portuguese milieu, in the Portuguese thing, Diyash Pasaj, those wonderful days, you know, the good old days. They were not good old days. You didn't have democracy then. We had. But we are 1970s. And I think the, the sort of jab in the heart becomes even more pronounced for people like us. So I was trying to wonder, especially when you go to Kalangut. Like, I haven't gone to Kalangut for the last 20 odd years. I refuse to go to Kalangut because, what is it? It's the Pattaya of Goa today. You know, it's absolutely horrible to look at. But I really wonder what it is that makes you miss Kalangut. And I think Kalangut is a fabulous metaphor for what has transpired in Goa. So is it that I miss those beaches, you know, the, the whole Shashi, Shashi Kapoor's St. Anthony's shack? Do I miss the palms? Do I miss the clean waters? I mean, if I want clean waters, if I want a clean beach, I want some palm trees, I can go to Sindhudurg, I can go to Karwar. You get equally beautiful beaches there now. I don't have to go to Kalangut. But what is it that you really miss in Kalangut? And that is what was there in the 70s. And that, to me, is the greatest definition of what it was to be a Goan. Very often we are recognized as Susega, which is, in my opinion, a very derogatory and a stupid term. But nevertheless, if people love to say that about us, it's OK, it's fine. But you know what we were in the 60s and 70s, perhaps to a certain extent in the 80s? What defined us? What defined, therefore, Kalangut? And that's what you miss when you go to Kalangut. There was the innocence of being a Goan. We were an innocent, vulnerable people. That's what we were. And that's been killed comprehensively. So when you go to Kalangut, yes, I mean, you see those bright lights, and you see those sleazy women, and you see, 
you know, people on drugs and people bashing up their bikes and I don't know, it's all terrible. But you essentially miss the innocence of Kalambut. You miss the innocence of Kolva. You miss the innocence of all these spots that we used to go to. And so therefore the innocence of Goa died somewhere in the 70s or the 80s. Then came economic liberalization in the 90s. We had economic liberalization. Goa was, of course, a pot of gold or a honey pot for the bees to come in. So a large amount of capital started infusing itself in the 90s and maybe early 2000s into Goa. That's when the entire boom started taking place. The real estate boom, the mining boom, the casino boom, the tourism boom, all the booms. And very often, the boom is associated with bombs. And that's what happened to Goa. Again, we became another piece of Gaza where the rest of India was just dropping its metaphorical bombs on us. And we could do nothing, simply, simply because the power of money was just so powerful or it was so alluring that all of us fell victim to it. And therefore, from an innocent generation, we moved on to being a cynical generation. So from the 90s onwards, right up to the 2000s, and you know, going through the GBA agitation, and going through the SEZ agitations, and going through the mining agitations, we have become a cynical generation. So a lot of us who are comfortable in our little cocoons are today a cynical generation. We just know that nothing is going to change. We've just given up hope. We've just given up hope in the political system. You know you can't change it, like the Congress Party, for instance, in Goa is nothing but what? A dress rehearsal for men or women of ill repute to be cultured, to be then handed over to the BJP. Yeah? That's what it's become. It's no longer politics. It's no longer about ideology. It's nothing. It's just bartering the, the women or the men of ill repute. See, I'm being politically correct. I say women and men of ill repute from one party to the next. So we've become a cynical generation. But there is this danger. And there is this danger that each and every one of us must keep an eye on. As a doctor, I should be protected from it. But you, captains of industry, people who are in business, people who are in finance, people who run the commerce of the state, you have to be very, very careful of this, because this is coming. So from an innocent generation of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we move to a cynical generation of from 90s to 2000s. That, are, that is us. That includes us. But now, what we see is not cynicism any longer. There is a political party that is there, which many of you hate, which many of you refuse to acknowledge, but uh, I somehow admire, the Revolutionary Goans Party. I don't agree with many of the things. But that is a political party that speaks about the youth. And you know what is the sentiment that is there? It is a sentiment of despair. It's despair. It's no longer cynicism now. It's despair. They are with their backs to the wall. They don't have jobs. They don't have proper growth incomes. They, they, do, not have, they do not see a future for themselves in Goa. The Portuguese passport gave a lot of our youth an avenue to run away from here. But there are a lot of them who have been left behind who are despairing at the present moment. And once that sentiment of despair, at the moment it's still under control. But if it really becomes a tidal wave, the first thing that will get submerged under it are all your institutions of commerce and finance and business. That's when that despair hits the roads that you realize that you then cannot put the genie back into the bottle. So you need to address this particular sentiment that is happening on the ground with the youth of Goa and which no political party is ready to address. All that the political parties do today, every single political party and particularly every single politician, all that they do is they drug this despairing or cynical population, which is you and me, all these youth who are struggling for their basic existence on the roads. So there's that opium that is given to them. The opium of these events. I mean, you travel from Panjim to Margao, half the way you don't know whether you should just take your car and just bang it into a 
you know, into a, into a pole somewhere and just finish it off, just die. Simply because at every juncture there is a, there's a smiling face of a politician looking at you through all those, I don't know, you know? I mean, how much can you take of it? You, you're like going, you see one of them, you see the CM, then you see somebody else, you see another minister, and another minister, and another minister. You vomit, you throw up, you, nothing, nothing helps. And you just feel like, all right, let's just fly off the bridge and finish it all off. No? So that's the opium that they use. Just these events, just this talk. It's just this whole Amrit Kal, and I don't know, Naya, Naya Goa, invest in Goa, something else. There's nothing tangible happening on the ground for these people. In election times, hire them as agents, give them money, give them doles, give them some money for festivals, keep them happy on that. That's not a solution to the problem. That's only adding to the problem, that's only going to make it worse. So this is the way that we have come to pass in this polluted state of mind. We are incapable of addressing the fact that we are responsible for the state, each and every one of us, particularly we, the privileged and educated class. We haven't, we have still been, as I said, still been fighting these little culture battles. Those culture battles might make no difference to our lives at all. These are now battles of actual existence, life and death scenarios for so many people. So unless we can get there, unless we can understand that, and understand that we need to address these problems as goans, as one amalgamated whole, there can be no solution to the problem. What then are the problems that we have? I think each and every one of us are familiar with the problems that we have. The fundamental problem that we have, I will not go into whether it's double tracking, whether it is, uh, you know, land grabs, real estate, whatever, 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 whatever. I mean, there are so many things that you can just go on, casinos, the works. But the fundamental issue is, and again, no society can survive this for a protracted period of time. It has to collapse. Is unregulated capital that is getting infused into the state. Unregulated capital. Capital has to be infused. But unregulated, unchecked, Greasing the palms from the top to the bottom. Corruption at every single avenue of society. That kind of capital can keep only some section of the society happy. That's the reason why you have this whole infusion of people from the north of the country, the northeast of the country. I'm not bothered whether they come for jobs. Of course, everybody has got this freedom to come for the jobs over here. And everybody's got the freedom to move. Go and move everywhere. Let anyone who wants to come here, come here. But there has to be some kind of a regulation of how this economy has to run. It cannot run amok like this by destroying everything that is dear to us. The classic example is Pedne. Today, the indigenous population of Pedne, I think we just need to go and document that and keep that for posterity. Because in another five years, that's going to disappear, absolutely disappear. The indigenous culture, the indigenous natural environment, the indigenous heritage of Pedne is going to disappear. Simply because we already know that there are parcels of land that has been sold off to, again, unregulated capital. I don't care whether it's going or non-going. But unregulated capital who are going to come and change that place into a Disney world in, I don't know, two years. You won't even be able to recognize it. Yes, you will say money has come in, the economy is doing well, look at our GDP and look at our... But if you're going to lose everything that was beautiful, that was ours, that could have grown slowly, look at examples. All of us have traveled. Look at the way Europe develops. Now, why do we always have to develop with this American model of just putting up gigantic bullshit everywhere that comes across us? You know, Create that kind of bling and glitz. Why can't we just keep our heritage intact. Look at the way Europe sells its heritage, right, as part of its tourism. Look at how careful they are about protecting their environment, how careful they are protecting about their water. Do we have a water policy? I mean, we've reached this stage that we, the Mahadi, that's the lifeline, supposed to give us water. Every single civilization, go through your history books, every single civilization, 
from the Abyssinians to the Babylonians to the Phoenicians to the Carthaginians to the pharaohs in Egypt, every single civilization died or withered away or disappeared because the water supply to those places eventually died off or dried off. That's the sustenance of life. But we don't have even this basic common sense and basic sense of self-preservation to keep our water bodies intact, our water bodies clean. In India, you know what this reminds me of, and therefore it would probably strike a chord, is Pune. No? Many of us have gone to Pune in the 70s and 80s, and many of us have gone to Pune now, travel now. Mumbai or Bombay has never been the bastion of Marathi culture. Never. Mumbai, Bombay was the financial capital. The bastion of Marathi culture was Pune. Everything that is beautiful about Marathi, its history, its heritage, its forts, its Shivaji, its every, everything, everything, everything happened in Pune. So what is Pune now? Where is the heritage of Pune? A Shaniwar Pet, one small two, three forts which are unkempt. Unless you have the good sense of going and climbing, climbing Raigad. I just hope they don't get to Raigad and destroy. But what is left in Pune now? It's just another megapolis of just buildings and buildings and buildings. Looks like another filthy Los Angeles. Where is the history? Where is the culture of Pune? And you can't reverse the clock back then. Now you can't get back to Pune of old. Therefore, as I say, in Goa, we are not in terminal decline, but we are in the intensive care unit. We need somehow to reverse the clock back. And therefore, I'm going to give you the solutions, which probably would be, five minutes more, which probably would be a little bit controversial. Many of you are not going to like my solutions. Maybe they're going to have to be different solutions. Because we live in different times. We live in the times of the emperor. We no longer live in a democracy. So the first thing that we need to do, this is paramount. If we don't do this, there's nothing more about Goa that we can save. Save or preserve or whatever. Nothing. We must finish off this identity politics of Goa. Once and for all, this must be put to rest. I think it's getting tiresome, absolutely tiresome, to keep reading in the news or going through your social media accounts and seeing that someone is being offended that somebody was something was said about St. Francis Xavier and something was said about Shivaji and something was said about someone else. We need to stop this. First and foremost, we need to be a little less pricky about our culture. Just enjoy it. Just let it roll. Just wear it like an easy t-shirt, your entire culture. Stop wearing it like a straight jacket. Stop wearing it like a tight-fitting suit. You know, you've seen a guy who's suited it's just always, you can't breathe. Just wear it like a t-shirt, your whole culture. Make it easy. Make it conversant. Make it jovial. Make it happy. And always respect it. So therefore, if there is a lot of things from the Portuguese culture, which becomes or has got imbibed as part of Goan culture, in a lot of the, especially in the coastal belt, amongst the Hindus and amongst the Catholics, right? It's there. So we are very picky about that. But just wear it easy. Just wear it calmly. Don't wear it as if it's like, you know, some kind of badge of honor. As if you are like the army of Napoleon Bonaparte going out to fight battles. No. And don't get too picky about that. The second thing you must remember when you say that this, whatever, what I call the Portuguese culture that has got itself imbued with Goan culture here. You must respect the culture that comes from the Novosh Conquistas. That is a little different culture from yours. Very different culture from yours. They genuinely respect Shivaji. They genuinely respect Sambhaji. Don't for one moment say, he is not part of our culture, he is some Maharashtra. No. They genuinely respect that because go through your history. 450 years of Portuguese rule was here in the coastal belt. That was a much, much smaller centuries of rule in the eastern belt, from Ponda to Satari to Kuchare to wherever, to Valpoi to Pedne. 
and Sambaji came there. He fought for them. He fought against the Portuguese. That was a son of the soil fighting against a foreign invader. So there's tremendous respect for Sambaji, tremendous respect for Shivaji in those areas. This has not been taught to us in our textbooks because the textbooks have been written by privileged people like us who lived in the coastal areas. And that history to them has been told orally. Through centuries it's been told to them. So that's the reason why they, well, almost worship these individuals over there. Now maybe nobody's asking you to worship that. But you must understand the importance of all these figures in that population of Goa. So it's fine if Konkani is your official language. But you must accept that there is a large section of people that hold Marathi dear to them. And you must respect that sentiment. Because if you don't respect that sentiment, and we are only fighting about this, we are only fighting these culture wars, then the battle of our existence itself, whether it's our water, whether it's our air, whether it's our natural environment, whether it's our forests, whether it's our, I don't know, everything that makes us really go on, that is what the politicians put up for sale to all the parties from Delhi or from abroad. Simply because like idiots, we are fighting these non-consequential battles of identity. We need to move from fighting for battles of identity to a fighting battles of our very existence. The second solution that I want to give you is perhaps a little, well, it's not so controversial. Of course, you have all these other solutions like following your heritage, zoning patterns, hopefully corruption will reduce, hopefully there'll be people with a heart to do the right thing for Goa, etc., etc. But those are all fairy tales. You know that that's not going to happen. You need to mount public pressure. So, you know what else we can do to fight this battle? We shouldn't fight this battle only as just Goans. I'm talking about the battle of our environment, keeping our environmental heritage, keeping our natural heritage, keeping our historical heritage alive in Goa and not making it another Bangalore, another Pune, or another God knows slum. We need to hold hands with another huge force that can work to our advantage. You know who they are? The people from Sindhudurg down to the people of Karwar or even beyond on the coastal belt. Because the people from Sindhudurg for sure now that Mopa is a reality are going to face the similar kind of assault that Goa has faced over the last two decades in the next five or ten years. Similarly, the people of Karwar and down south. You're going to have all these huge hotel sharks and all these huge real estate brokers and all these punters and gamblers punting on this property here in this belt. So if we think that we are numerically small as far as the coastal belt or part of Goa which is being inundated now, then we need to hold hands with them quickly to think up of measures by which this entire belt can put up a wall of resistance against this unregulated capital that comes in. But we'll have to have the courage to do that. We'll have the courage to reach out to that. We can't say, te ganti, te baile, te marathi, they wanted to take over Goa. If you come back to that, you're coming back to your politics of identity. You're not fighting your politics of survival. And the third, and I'll wind up my talk with that, and this is going to be, well, you're not going to like this, but that's the way it is. <clears throat> Many people ask me how, what happened? What happened during the Goa Bachao Abhiyan, if you remember? How did you, how did the regional plan get revoked? Or what happened during SEZ? How did the SEZ plan get revoked? So many people thought, oh, Oscar, you did a wonderful thing. You gave your speeches. And even I believe that spiel for some time that, you know, my speeches was what caused the thing to reverse back. Nothing. That was all drama that happened in front. At the back, the reason why the regional plan was revoked, the, regional, the reason why SEZ was revoked, the reason why a lot of the land 
was saved in Goa during those years. It is because the maximum voices of protest that rose against those terrible policies that were out to destroy Goa came from the population that voted the Congress. And the Congress was in power in Goa. Many people love to hate the church. Many people love to say that the church does things only for itself. Maybe it does. But in this, I'm a personal witness to how the church actually wanted to defend the land of Goa. The issues of land which are now engulfing all of us, that is what the church wanted to defend. That is what a large section of the supporters of the Congress, particularly in Salset, wanted to defend. And the Congress realized, the Congress of those times, which was in power, which was, of course, as corrupt as ever, and it is the same Congress which today, in the name of the BJP, is ruling us, huh? by the way. That, nothing has changed. Yeah. But that it was the Congress supporters then who rose up against the Congress government. The Congress government realized that they cannot fool around and they cannot antagonize, they cannot piss off their own supporters. So that's the reason why they gave in. Not because of our speeches, not because of our debates. That was for public consumption. The reason is a politician will change his policy only when there is fear that he could be losing power. No other reason. Absolutely no other reason. Or if you give him enough amount of money, which we don't have, to change the policy, which is what all these fly-by-night operators from Delhi do. So if we want to change now, please don't look for political solutions. I'll be very blunt and very honest for you, with you. There is no political solution. Because at the present moment, as I said, this colonization by Delhi of Goa is complete. It's a complete, it's a fait accompli. So the government in Goa will be of the party that is in power in Delhi, period. Don't for one moment think that we are going to resist Delhi by changing a government. Nothing. The last time round, even if you had five BJP MLAs and 35 of the Congress, it still would have been 35 of them would have, or 30 of them would have moved one side and it would have become BJP government again. Because the center is BJP. So all the money, all the threats, <laughs> everything would have come from the top and stuff would have changed. So what needs to be done now is because at the end of the day, whether you're a Congress supporter, whether you're a BJP supporter, an RGP supporter, or you, but you're basically a Goan, you want the same thing. All of us are feeling that sense of helplessness, and all of us are under siege. You agree? So we need those of us, or those of you, not me, those of you who are staunch BJP supporters, those of you who have got access to corridors of power, you need to impress strongly in the corridors of power that this kind of nonsense that is passing off as public policy in Goa needs to change course. So we need the BJP supporter this time, because it's a BJP government, to mount pressure on their own government to change the policy to suit Goa and Goa's needs and stem the irrevocable decimation, disintegration, and destruction of Goa. If it means writing a letter to the Prime Minister, writing a letter to the Home Minister to instruct these guys to stop fooling around with Section 17B and whatever, whatever they're doing, I forget all the sections, they'll do it in a heartbeat. One signal from the top and they'll do it in a heartbeat. So this is what we have to target. So wherever we have possible contacts at the top, we need to request and urge the central government to instruct the state government that this is not the way that we can, you can be running Goa. This has to change. And if there's pressure from the center, trust me, these guys who are, you know, just there for, I don't know, running a the local government which just is like, I don't know, it's running a mafia state. It has to be told from the top that this is not the way that you can run the government.
you've got to change. Not by street protests, not by the opposition, because the opposition is so discredited today. Not by a political opposition, but it has to be a groundswell of opposition from the BJP voter, from the BJP supporter, telling the BJP top brass that enough is enough. This is not the way, this is the same way that the Congress ran the government from 2000 and whatever, 2007 to 2012, and the same way that it has been run for so many years on end. So you need to appeal. I don't know how. How many Claudes we have to keep filing PILs, I do not know. Claude is over 75. We don't see a new generation able to do that. Because if we cannot change this in this way, in a semi-democratic way, you can be sure that the cynicism is going to turn to despair, and that despair will engulf us like a fire that none of us will be able to douse or put off. On that note of hope, I leave you. Thank you very much.